Welcome to the City Club of Portland, Oregon's premier citizens forum. We're delighted that you're with us today. I'm Don Williams, president of City Club. Today's speaker is David Frunmeyer, president of the University of Oregon. He will speak on the challenges facing Oregon's system of higher education. For the benefit of our radio and television audiences, please turn off your cell phones or other electronic devices. First, a few announcements. Next Friday, our program will feature Vancouver, Washington Mayor Royce Pollard. He will lead a panel including the Vancouver City Manager and the President of the Columbia River Economic Development Council. Vancouver celebrates its 150th anniversary this year, so help us welcome our neighbor to the north for the discussion regarding Vancouver's growth, economic development, and regional collaboration. Citizen salons are back this summer, and they're a great opportunity to get involved in C City Club, and they're also fun and interesting. For example, join provocateur Tom Manley, president of Pacific Northwest College of Arts, and his hosts on July 1st at, oh, just a minute, Kim, Kim McCool said that the July 1st Citizens Forum, Citizen Salon is sold out, so you'll have to look at our brochure for some of the others, two are sold out, so I would urge you to take a look at the brochure and make your reservations for the City Club office. On Thursday, June 28th, at 6 o'clock, Agora concludes its tours of Green Building in Portland. Former City Club President Patty Tillett will lead a tour and discussion of sustainable architecture and culture along the Mississippi, North Mississippi area in Portland. Call the City Club for reservations. We're proud of our growth in City Club, but I need to do some myth busting about City Club membership. First, there's no qualification other than a commitment to public service and public life. You don't need a sponsor. You don't have to undergo a background check. There's no well waiting or eligibility period. And persons under 30 and under even get one half off their membership dues you can find a membership application at each table. Last week, Oregon's Chief Justice mentioned an alarming statistic. Based on an American Bar Association survey, more than half of those responding could not identify the three branches of government, and 22% of those responding thought that the three branches were Republican, Democrat, and Independent. He pointed out that civic education is no longer taught in 38 states. When you join City Club, you help remedy this situation. City Club and our partner, Oregon Public Broadcasting, both actively, actively promote civic education. In fact, it's part of our primary mission. Regardless of how many Friday forums you can attend, your membership helps keep alive the civic spark in our community. We encourage you to join us. Our new member today, is Eric Stiefotter. He is a trainer with Northwest Regional Educational Laboratories. Eric, would you please stand? <laughs> We're fortunate to have terrific civic corporate sponsors. Our sponsors this quarter are Zimmer Gunsel Frosca Architects and Stoll Rees LLP. Please join me in thanking them for their generosity. Last Friday, the Chief Justice also told us that Oregon ranked last behind 49 other states in the District of Columbia in judicial salaries. Although Oregon isn't last in the next statistic I'm going to give you, should we be satisfied with being 43rd? And that's, although Oregon's not last, well, that's our rank uh, among states and per student spending in colleges and universities. Oregon spends $2,100 less than the national average per student. Students are rightfully concerned that the tuition and fees at Oregon University have increased 57% since 2001. They leave school with the nation's eighth highest debt, about $20,000 per student. Less than a mile south of where we're meeting, Lincoln Hall at Portland State University houses approximately 12% of the PSU classes. It was built in 1911 and now needs $36 million 
in seismic upgrades and deferred maintenance. It has a roof filled with asbestos and acoustic tiles fall off the ceiling. To the north, Washington Governor Gregor states, we absolutely believe that the University of Washington and Washington State University are two of the, ec the greatest economic growth engines in the state. In 2006, Washington spending was $8,200 per four-year student, and this compares to Oregon's $3,900 per student. Higher education competes with prisons, parks, and salmon for funding in the Oregon legislature. Lawmakers ask for accountability if additional funding is provided for education. Will there be a change in the tenure program or system? And how do we measure performance? Fortunately, our speaker today is one who offers solutions and doesn't just identify problems. Dave Frommeyer is no stranger to the City Club. In fact, a detailed search of our archives reveal he's spoken to us at Friday forums in the following years, 1982 and 1986, 1993, 5, 9, and 2003. Now, for those of you who are mathematically challenged, that's an average of once every 3.6 years. <laughs> and having heard Dave spoke, speak on four of those occasions, I can say that he has delivered three of the best jokes I've ever heard a City Club speaker give. Fortunately, only one was a lawyer joke. Dave Frohnmeyer was appointed president of the University of Oregon in 1994 after having served as dean of the Oregon Law School for two years. He's a native of Medford and the first native Oregonian appointed president of any Oregon public college or university. His record in public service is absolutely outstanding. During his 10 years as attorney general, he argued and won six of seven cases at the United States Supreme Court. This was the most cases and the best record of any contemporary attorney general at that time. He also served three, three terms in the Oregon House and as a law professor and legal consultant or legal counsel to the president of the University of Oregon. He and his wife, Lynn, are founders of the Fanconi Anemia Research Fund, and over the last 25 years, it has enabled ma major progress in fighting the disease. And in fact, a major part of that funding for that uh, fund has come from Oregonians. He's also one of the founding directors of the National Marrow Donor Program. He, he graduated magna cum laude from Harvard College and then attended Oxford University on a Rhodes Scholarship. He received his law degree from the University of California, Berkeley. Now those in our radio audience didn't get to see, and some of you didn't get to see, uh, that our speaker hobbled in today on crutches. In a telephone conversation yesterday, Dave admitted that this wasn't due to a skirmish with the legislature, but it was due to a recent ski accident. He took full responsibility for the mishap, although he did say Lynn was leading at the time it occurred. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Dave Frohnmeyer. Thank you very much, Don, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for the invitation to speak to this most distinguished forum. Is this Oregon? I offer today no insights into the conclusion earlier this week of The Sopranos, and no commentary, legal or otherwise, on the incarceration of Paris Hilton. <laughs> I want also to state for the record that I wish the Beavers bas bas baseball team good luck with the hopes of all Oregonians that they can sweep to a second collegiate World Series championship title. So with these disclaimers, I'll offer those of you who came here under some serious misunderstanding of the nature of my talk uh, to leave now and find your way to the nearest Fox News outlet. <laughs> Is this Oregon? I ask it, of course, rhetorically. Because no, the, the boundaries have not changed. Oregon is still outlined by the Pacific Ocean to the west, the Columbia River on the north, the Idaho border to the east, and the Nevada-California border tracing the 42nd parallel on the south. It still rains regularly, at least west of the Cascades, and at least until the 4th of July. And as you well know, 
on any parade any time of year. <laughs> we still hold great pride in our heritage, in our pioneer spirit, and our varied athletic teams. But much has changed in the last 20 years, so much so that some might mistake us for, well, actually, I won't name a state because someone from there is bound to be present today or listening in with our audience. But perhaps the change can best be described, as it in fact was, by the wonderful first five words of a story in the Bend Bulletin late last year by writer James Sinks, and I quote, once Oregon was a beacon. Now, I'm not going to run through that litany of names and accomplishments that created what was nationally known as the Oregon story. We were, though, as Mr. Sinks points out in his article, once dubbed by Newsweek as the place where, quote, the future works. Now, which of course is that future, we seem to have settled for infrastructure that does not meet our needs, public safety replaced by warehousing, health replaced by what is often uncaring, not even benign neglect. Parks and places of beauty are shining jewels now characterized by second-rate facilities, public education into the lower tiers of public support, higher education, well, I'll jump into that shortly. We've given away our state, and I'll give away this stick, to too many special interests, beer and bottles, for example, cigarettes, and yes, gambling, instead of insisting that all Oregonians, individuals, and corporations must be good citizens of this state. And leadership, although I see a possible and hopeful resurgence, leadership is too often given away to the pseudo-democratic seduction of a budget-wrecking initiative system that long since has careened out of control. We are doing what the Nobel Prize-winning economist Michael Spence, who loves Oregon, by the way, calls signaling. Through his research on markets with what he called asymmetric information, Michael Spence developed the theory of signaling to show how better informed individuals in the market communicate their information to the less well-informed to avoid the problems associated with adverse selection. In his seminal paper in 1973 called Job Market Signaling, Spence demonstrated how a college degree, for example, signals a job seeker's intelligence and ability to a prospective employer. Other examples of signaling included giving large dividends to, by corporations to demonstrate their profitability, and manufacturers issuing guarantees to convey the high quality of a product. Unfortunately, it's a negative signal that we've been sending from Oregon, a signaling that sends the message that we're not quite ready to pay the price for excellence, that we're not willing in many ways to convey the idea of a quality product. We're consuming the seed corn without much thought about what we can leave for the next generation. These are thoughts that crystallized for me once again only a few days ago when my wife Lynn and I took a trip to China for a major meeting of the Association of Pacific Rim Universities, of which we were a co-founder 11 years ago. In China, we see a nation characterized by the, its 20th year of compounded 8% continuous growth. Now, let me add, of course, some clear understandings. China is not a democratic country. China is an autocracy still controlled by the Communist Party elite, even though it has voraciously adopted capitalistic economics and behaviors. And as such, it can, far easier than messy democracies, make decisions regarding national priorities. But the Chinese, the Japanese, the Koreans, the Vietnamese, the Indians, much of Europe, and even growing economies in South America are making an investment in higher education a national priority because they understand. South Korea, by the way, the most wired and wireless nation in the world, now graduates more engineers than the United States. The European Union graduates three times as many, and China six times as many. China has an official 15-year plan to increase its technical capacity. 
Paul Chu, the eminent president of the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, told me at this meeting just two weeks ago that he expects 25 to 30 percent annual budget increases for his institution for the foreseeable future. The Chinese middle class in raw numbers is bigger now than the American middle class. That is to say, persons who can afford a University of Oregon education, even paying non-resident tuition. Virtually all the nations represented by the Association of Pacific Rim Universities are dramatically increasing higher education budgets, as David Sarason hopefully and helpfully reported two weeks ago in the Oregonian. They understand what we must, that it is a matter of survival, not a disposable luxury that can be turned on and off. China brings to these national policies a Confucian work ethic that is several millennia older than Mao, and a national pride that drives its willingness to invest in what it knows will create a future that works. Now, I am nowhere suggesting that we abolish democracy for autocracy, but I'm suggesting that leaders in Oregon and this nation must begin to see what it is that will make our future work with the startling clarity that other nations have recognized and without question, investment in higher education is one of those priorities. Does Oregon shine? In 2007, the Oregon Shines benchmark report of the Oregon Progress Board had many good things to say about where we are as a state. But in its executive summary, it pointed out, perhaps with understatement, that some aspects of education, civic engagement, social support, and the environment still give reasons for concern. And they should. Here on. Of the 24 indicators regarding the economy, only about half achieved the 2005 target. Unemployment did decrease. That's helpful. More jobs were created. That, of course, is heartening. But many benchmark indicators missed the target or are off course. The most telling of them, and hear it as I say it slowly, is that personal income as a percentage of the United States is near its lowest level in 20 years. Only one Oregon worker in three is at or above the 150% of poverty for a family of four. Oregon's national rank for trade with other states and countries, which brings new money into the state, worsened, even though export values, export values increased. Compared to other states, Oregon's concentration of professional services, a high-end part of the economy, such as those provided by lawyers, bankers, accountants, healthcare workers, also fell. Our rank for economic diversification fell below that expected for 2005. That's why, in significant part, what is needed is the already good start on the state legislature this time around on reinvestment in higher education. I think you know why, but rather than speak in abstractions, let me try to reduce it to something we all understand, even if that isn't the highest value of higher education, economic indicators. Today, collectively, the University of Oregon, Portland State University, and Oregon State University create a collective measurable economic impact for this state of greater than $3 billion annually. I ask you to think, when is the last time Oregon chased or nurtured another $3 billion industry and successfully landed it. This, of course, does not even mention Oregon Health and Sciences University, that shining city in itself on the hill, which alone accounts for well over $1 billion of economic impact annually by itself. So sure, the legislature's reinvestment is a good start, but it gets the patient off life support. It doesn't talk about sustainability. And what we need to carry forward this tremendous economic engine is an investment that needs to be replicated for the next four or five legislative sessions. That calls not only for the kind of leadership shown by the governor and legislators in these past few months, it is something as rare as it is necessary. Willpower and focus sustained over the next decade. As higher education generates this incredible return on the state's investment. It, of course, also continues 
to pursue its most important mission, preparing the next generation of Oregon's leaders, cultural, civic, political, social. We provide the students with the critical thinking and leadership skills necessary to prepare them for successful careers in business education, government service, their families, their communities. This sounds like an abstraction, maybe, but it's not. Data that's easily accessible to any of us will demonstrate to you that the average college graduate will generate nearly a million dollars more in family earning power over a lifetime than an equivalent person who's only been able to obtain a high school diploma. Said another way, and it needs to be put this directly, this is quite literally the difference between the middle-class dream that dates at least back to the writings of Alexis de Tocqueville and a lifetime of being nickeled and dined. Just a little bit about the University of Oregon, and only because I think I know it fairly well. Per research dollar, the University of Oregon is one of the top research universities in the nation for translating basic discoveries into practical applications. Something that might have been unheard of a few years ago, last year we returned $4.3 million to our bottom line from royalties, patent income, software licenses, and technological transfer. In recent years, the University of Oregon faculty, staff, and students have started more than 60 companies, many of them now booming. Consider something that in the private sector is known as return on investment. The investment by the state of Oregon just two years ago in the University of Oregon was $60 million of tax dollars. That's all. That's 13% of our budget. That's all. In return for that, the University of Oregon measurably brought back to the state more than $1.2 billion in spending. That's a 20 to 1 return on the state taxpayer's investment. If we were a private company, you'd want to invest, and I'd certainly want to sell shares. And maybe even more significantly, in a balance of payments context, and we need to think about that as a state with only 1% of the nation's population, a significant part of our revenue was from out of state, from federal grants and contracts for research, for student assistance, and from non-resident tuition. And the vast majority of our nearly half billion dollar budget was spent in this state and region. Oregon State University and Portland State University have similar profiles in terms of their net economic advantage added to the economies and hence to the meal of, meals of families in this state. We are, I think, collectively as institutions of higher education, very stable employers and stable at the upper end of family income. The University of Oregon by itself, down there in Lane County, is the state's 14th largest employer. Our employment is almost exactly that of Portland International Airport or Emanuel Hospital and Health Center, by way of comparison. In addition to the 4,000 jobs that we sustain directly, a conservative economic multiplier of our research dollars alone says that we support another 4,600 high-end jobs elsewhere. And I haven't touched, ladies and gentlemen, I don't think I need to because the building is visible to those of you in this larger area as you look at uh, what's happening on the new campus of Oregon Health and Sciences University. Capital construction of higher education facilities is a major addition to local economies throughout the state. We've completed in the last few years, for example, more than $211 million worth of projects with at least $100 million more planned in our own community. Portland State, OHSU have the same impact on this metro area. All of this economic impact data may sound great, or perhaps our heads are swimming in numbers at this point. What would be more impressive, though, is if the contribution of the state to this effort were something that it was in 1999, but it's not. We're just getting back there. It's not even in raw dollars what it was in 1989 which those of you with sharp memories, and that's everyone in this audience, will remember is just one year before the catastrophe of Measure 5 on the state's general fund. So let me ask you this question, if I may, and I hope I don't tax your patience or trespass on your time. Given this hard information 
And you can take this information to any economist and peer review it, and I believe our numbers are accurate. What sort of leadership in any state would ignore the facts, ignore the impact both today and tomorrow and the future in what everyone knows will be a knowledge economy characterized by the explosion of information and the need to process it by people who have high levels of education? Who, who would not seek creative, inventive ways to build that future? What sort of leadership would deny that competitive edge really that very possibility actually of economic survival for future generations when it is so doable, when there's a leverage of 20 to 1 on any state dollar that's likely to be replicated by any institution of the kind I've described. What leadership would want even to flirt with hiding logic or truth or some of the most basic principles of political demagogy in order to win votes and lose the future? But short-run thinking of the past, regrettably, was and has been to take the easy way in a number of formulas, but here's the most obvious one. Short change the general fund support because we can always make up for it in the student's tuition. After all, if they're going to get this lifetime of advantages in earning power, why not charge them at the front end and we'll make the state's contribution even less? We're paying the price for that thinking, or the we maybe is misplaced, I'm not. But two-thirds of the 18,000 students who are getting degrees from Oregon's universities this weekend will leave school with an average debt of about $19,000 apiece. That means public service careers foreclosed, marriage plans perhaps postponed, dreams of a family and home ownership so central to the American middle class, something of a distant grasp in a distant future. Oregon graduates now, because of these policies, carry the eighth highest debt load in the nation because our tuition levels are higher and our student aid formula is lower than most other states. On an average, an Oregon family has to come up with 30% of its income after financial aid to put a student not in an elite school, but through a state university in this state. These are according to statistics from the National Center for Public Policy and Higher Education. Well, is your speaker today, however urgent the tone of voice, nonetheless still a self-serving Cassandra? I, I think I have some evidence to the contrary. The Oregon University System Board, a group of intelligent, highly motivated citizen volunteers who serve without pay to act as our governing board of the system, looked at the severity of these issues, looked at the fact that last summer six out of seven of the institutions were underwater or nearly so financially, and united in an urgent plea for a budget that would approach something like the billion dollars that was necessary to start the Build Back product. These were your friends and neighbors not paid to make the claim before this distinguished forum. Am I not grateful for what the governor and the legislature have done this session? Am I not grateful for the welcome voices of concern from the Oregon print media in particular? As I said earlier, yes, and actually profoundly so. It is a start, it's a good start, but it is only that. The governor in particular has been steadfast in his support, even though this issue doesn't poll particularly well in terms of the public's eyes of what is a crisis and what is not. But the fact is that higher education, whether we like it or not, is the driving force, the ticket to the middle class. And unfortunately, up till now, our ticket has been taking us exactly backward. Some years ago, something passing for leadership in this state convinced us of something that was not quite what it passed for reminded me of a story I saw recently about a popular New York chef and star of the Food Network's Iron Chef, Mario Batali. By the way, this is a program I do not watch regularly. I had to. A year before Prune came Babo. There, the chef, Mario Batali, scattered organ meat across the menu and presaged the lardo pizza he would serve at Otto with lardo bruschetta, although he didn't have the nerve to call it that. At his very hip restaurant, Babo, 
he told the diners that the toasted bread was covered in prosciutto bianco, or white prosciutto. But prosciutto bianco, white prosciutto, was a nonsense term he coined to disguise the truth. The truth was that it should have been called lardo. Quote, I knew that they just wouldn't eat it, the chef explained, if I just said, this is the fat of a pig melted on toast. <laughs> well, we've been sold the fat of a pig melted on toast, and it's time for us to call it that and move on to something different and more creative, isn't it? In fact, we need to return to the creativity and hard decisions that are needed in Oregon to, to recognize Oregon again as the state we know and the state that has a future that we want. There will be a cost, but that is too is something that Oregonians have also known and have been willing to pay with their eyes open. Higher education can lead the way, but leadership too has a price. I spoke to a president of yet another leading Chinese university during this recent visit. He told me that 22% of the Chinese population now has some form of college education, and they're aiming to raise that to 30%. 30% would be substantially higher than Oregon, by the way, and our trend is actually moving in the opposite direction. It's entirely possible, as Chancellor George Pernsteiner has publicly warned in recent months, that we could be watching at this moment the first generation in Oregon where the young have less college education than their parents. Let me repeat that. Statistically, fewer young people are getting a college education than is possessed by the generation ahead of them. This is a situation ripe for social and economic disaster. I should also add that during this time when we rally for education in all corners, that the college education, educated statistically essentially provide the value added income that pays for our state's education systems at every level. I've recently, as I've described, had the opportunity to see Oregon through Asian eyes, but I hasten to say not as a reader of tea leaves or goat entrails on the floor, but as one educated citizen, concerned citizen to another, I gained insight. I saw people with their goals firmly fixed on making the next century theirs. At forum after forum, they spoke of the Asian century with confidence and as though it were a nearly accomplished fact. I saw people betting firmly that higher education would continue to open doors to economic opportunity and to worldwide status. I saw people who believed that investing now can make a difference. By the way, I don't know if you knew it, I was surprised to find out, but then I thought about it more and maybe not so much, that China has the highest personal savings rate of any major country in the world. I was asked today if I would come with solutions and was cautioned that among some listeners in this incredibly important audience, there would be many questions, perhaps asking about accountability perhaps questioning the tenure system, or rising college costs and saying, first address those issues and then come to us for your plea for more support. Each of those I would hasten to add, and you surely know would be the topic for a separate address at the City Club. However, I just add these thoughts, that higher education is acknowledged by the legislature itself and recently to have some of the most precise performance indicators of any of the publicly funded sectors. We regularly measure student satisfaction rates, graduation rates, student retention between freshman and sophomore years, and postgraduate success. We measure that every other year. Consideration of these factors and looking at our report card is a regular part of our budget process, and we've just been through it. And rather amazingly enough, almost all of these indicators are up notwithstanding tight budgets of recent years. Our entire university is analyzed up one corridor and down another classroom by a decennial accreditation team from across the nation, and this happens to every institution of higher education. It's called peer review. It's honest, and it's not always kind. Our faculty, when they are in the tenure process, undergo a rigorous process for assessment annually. 
and they do so comprehensively every seven years. And at the end of the first six, a faculty member is either approved or out. One can't attain the rank of full professor, typically until 14 years of sustained excellence in teaching as well as research have been demonstrated. In that evaluation, their work is examined oftentimes by experts from afar and people the candidate doesn't even know to determine whether the work has promise of continuing uh, support and existence over a lifetime. I would propose that at least that kind of assessment would put many areas of the private sector quite to shame, or at least make them rethink a few of the aspects of their own bonus systems. On costs, first we've not for the past 15 years had the margin to become inefficient, so in that respect perhaps starvation is a virtue. But in any effect, uh, even by the most crude of measures, higher education in Oregon has been more efficient with its dollars than all but four other states in the United States of America. You want solutions? To paraphrase a Jack Nicholson film character, I don't know if we can handle solutions, but I offer some in broad brush. The first one of them, and it shouldn't surprise anyone here, is tax reform. There's been an imbalance in our system for years. We have to somehow, against the odds that we're all too familiar with and the ballot rejections, which we remember sometimes stingingly, create stability and flexibility in our taxation system. We have to be able to plan ahead, not tear up our blueprint every two years, and also create an equitable system for households and businesses. To me, this means some kind of consumption tax but I'm open to other ideas. I might add here just a note of interest in a front page article in today's Oregonian. Researchers at the University of Oregon have recently published findings that the same regions of the brain that fire positively in response to food and other sensual pleasures also fire positively when people experience the process of paying taxes. I'm just fantasizing here, perhaps. <laughs> but, but a note to our future legislators that there might be a way to make the connections between uh, incentive and reward. If that happens, who knows what might be accomplished in the pleasure centers of our brains. <laughs> a second suggestion, really a second agenda item, the initiative system. The system in which we do take some rightful pride as made Oregon for too long an excessively large pasture for this sacred cow. My belief, and that of many others, is that it's past time for refining of this system. At a minimum, it should have to observe the same requirements of a balanced budget that the legislature must observe. That is to say, there should be no lawfully imposed expenses without accompanying funded revenues to match. There should be no forced expense cuts without a precise indication of where the loss of hope or opportunity, or for that matter, waste and abuse, should be cut with it. This is what I'd call truth in voting. Measures in 11 and 5 both violate these basic precepts of government and of accountability, in my view. And in other places, I've argued that this violates the guarantee clause of Article 4 of the United States Constitution. The legislature has to provide a balanced budget under the Oregon Constitution when the people as a whole act as a legislature under the initiative process we should be held to that same restriction which is the same thing that the responsible head of any household would observe truth in voting indeed and third prescriptive of course we need to elect people who have the capacity to look for the long haul our greatest moments as a state were not achieved by short-termers and short-timers in the habit of forgetting the needs of their children and grandchildren. America has the finest higher education system in the world. I hope nothing I have said today detracts from that fundamental truth. The leaders of these great Chinese universities with whom I spoke were, I think without exception, all holders of postgraduate degrees from American research universities. They know something good when they see it. They want, because they admire it, they want to emulate it. And they're doing so 
as I speak. It would be sadly ironic if we were to forget our own roots and origins of our own dynamism and be eclipsed by those who elsewhere remember it. Much has been written in the past few years about the greatest generation, about how literally millions rose in almost miraculous fashion to meet the incredible challenges of worldwide economic depression and beyond that, worldwide warfare against despotism and tyranny. In so many ways they did save our world. They kept it out of the dark ages it would have taken decades or perhaps even centuries to return from. Do, do we need such a miracle of leadership today? Well, while miracles never hurt, I don't even believe that that is necessary. I teach a freshman class on leadership each year. It's, by the way, a great joy to be with these young minds. And I've learned, as I hope my students have a great deal from it, that leadership is not easy, that it demands creativity, that it must often connect difficult solutions with deeply held values and a concordance of values that may not be attainable in an obvious way. But another thing I've observed it, is, it does not take many, for better or for worse, to create leadership that matters. History is, in fact, filled with examples of men and women, often just a few, who at the right time have stepped forward, seized the right place, and made a difference. Sometimes for the worse, but so often for the better. American history at the time of the Revolution and again during the American Civil War shows how much a few people can matter. The irony in some ways, of course, is that the needed leadership will arise from the educated, but the education can only happen by the acts of leaders. Now may just be the time for those leaders to arise. Perhaps, indeed I hope, some in this very room who believe it is time again for Oregon to be a beacon. Thank you very much. Asking questions is a privilege of City Club membership. Now, if Dave Fronmeyer can succinctly summarize complex legal theories when he argues before the U.S. Supreme Court, City Club members should be able to ask a meaningful question in 30 seconds or less. And in fact, if you don't meet that timeline, you will receive the dreaded sign, which for the first time in City Club history is in color. Today's first question will be asked by our board host, Marge Kafori. Marge is a political consultant and the former director of government relations at the city of Portland, where she served for 19 years. Her most recent efforts were working on amendments to the Oregon Bottle Bill. Marge. Thank you, Don, and thank you, Dave, uh, for a magnificent speech. I first met Dave about 30 years ago, and I was such an admirer of his intellect, and I continue to be so today. My question is this, and with a nod to those who do appreciate activities that involve running with or hitting balls, what would it take to get Oregonians and the legislature to be as enthusiastic about academic superiority as they are about the victories of college sports teams? Thank you very much, Marge Gafori. And just as an aside uh, to, the, to this red thing, as you may have noticed, the crutch I'm carrying has a, a, a useful uh, comparison to a shepherd's crook. And if I go too long in my response, I've left the other crutch by Don uh, so he can use it appropriately. Marge, you ask a very good question. Uh, intercollegiate athletics is a window on our universities. And it's something that does uh, open people's perspectives to their wider mission. Uh, were it otherwise, we'd be in a different world. I, the editors of the Oregonian once told me, why isn't it uh, that academic 
world isn't covered more. And then they did a CD-ROM search of their archives for a year and found that 70% of the mentions of the University of Oregon in the pages of our largest newspaper were in the sports columns, uh, rather than the news or regions. So uh, part of that is telling our own secrets better, telling them with the same sense of urgency uh, that a fan may feel on a Saturday morning before a game, uh, giving people a sense that this is something around which we can unite because, in fact, uh, it's important not just for our entertainment, but actually for our survival. Uh, so we, we need to have something of a sense of real urgency of the value of our educational system, particularly uh, in the dimensions that I've just described them. The rest of the world gets it and is unashamed. Uh, I'll take any window onto higher education that I can get uh, as long as we represent what it, what it is and what it's part of our life is honestly. And I think to that degree, uh, that intercollegiate athletics, in fact, can attract the passions of a people and unite them. We need to use that as a springboard for saying, uh, we have our academic all-stars too, and they may have far more to do with the health of our future than anything else that we do. Uh, member David Roth, member. Uh, before I ask my question, I'd like to confess that I read the sports page uh, before I read anything in the newspaper otherwise. So I agree with you about the importance of uh, how people look on the football field. Um, my question is, is related to leadership too. Um, over the last 20 years, the percentage of income tax paid by corporations in Oregon has dwindled dramatically, as you know. Uh, and that's a big part of the impact on uh, the state that's affected uh, higher education and other funding. In this legislative session, that's been reversed significantly, but it appears temporarily in the agreement to uh, uh, reserve the, ki the corporate kicker for, a, for one uh, biennium. Uh, that's great news. My question to you is, what do you think it will take to persuade Oregon's business leadership that they should continue that uh, uh, for that form of commitment to the public interest. Uh, I, I thank you for the question. My, my reaction in talking for, to a large number of business leaders is that they want to continue that that same trend. I, I do not sense either hostility or resistance to it. Uh, I think they don't want to be. Uh, stampeded in, into a, a change of the system that's so fundamental that they feel that they don't have some voice in its new dimensions. But I, I agree with you in terms just of the raw economic data of the shift away uh, and in, in, uh, to the detriment of the personal income taxpayer that we've seen over the last 20 years and find that difficult to justify over the long run. But I, I think business leaders understand that there needs to be an accommodation if it's not a runaway one. Dave, Steve Shell, member. Uh, when you and I were younger, we had a great dream for Oregon, and and I remember you and the legislature talking about some of those possibilities. You've addressed leadership, and you have addressed academics, but I'd like you to address the Oregon voter and the Oregonian as a decision maker in our society. What's happened? from that time to this, to change how our voters respond to issues that are repeated over and over and over again. Tax reform, change the initiative process, leadership, it's old news, yet it doesn't get through. Why? Uh, Steve, a good question. I've, I've I've written about that some years ago, and I actually stand by my conclusions today. There, there is, throughout the American body politic, something that I've called the emergence of the new tribalism. Uh, uh, tighter and tighter, uh, smaller groups with more vociferous and intense political dialogue. The level and character of gubernatorial politics is very different than it was even when I had the opportunity to run for governor now 17 years ago. Uh, it's vicious, uh, vicious fueled by uh, special interest money by, by political action committees out of control effectively of uh, effective public monitoring uh, and smaller and smaller and more intense tribes. Part of that faithfully reflects um, the, the emergence of, of uh, religious views into politics in a way that's more intense 
now than I've seen throughout my lifetime. Uh, the, the view that polarization is to be encouraged rather than discouraged, uh, the emergence of toxic talk radio uh, and talk television uh, in ways that are really designed to reinforce one's base rather than to reach across them. You know, there's this old adage, you know, that you, you can always tell a Harvard man, but you can't tell him very much. Um, th there's a little bit of that in, in that we're not seeking out common forums, but we're looking at more and more splintered ones, and that makes accommodation of those competing interests harder and harder to do at a, at a political level. So I, I don't see any quick fix to it, Steve, and I'm, I, I, I'm not sure that if I didn't have that formula that I wouldn't long since have taken the, the, the stopper out of the bottle. But I think it's just harder for those who are in public office today to find that magical consensus that once caused the Democratic uh, uh, chairman of the state of Oregon to shake his head ruefully looking at Tom McCall and say, I've never seen anyone who more perfectly embodies Rousseau's notion of the general will. I wish we could do that. Uh, so that, that's, that's something that was a part and parcel of, of the 1960s and 70s. I'd profoundly love to see it recreated here and hope to be calling myself one tiny part of that even at this moment. Thank you. Um, this uh, really has a question in two parts. Uh, as a member of the Portland, of the uh, Public Commission of Legislature, as well as being university president, what impact do you think that the partisan politics in Oregon has played in funding public higher education, and do you think it has changed this session? Um, that, that's a good question. I actually happily have seen little negative partisanship associated with uh, with higher education politics. And one might have expected more of it, but in fact I've seen leaders of both parties really work uh, in an extraordinary coalition to try to do something about higher education. Um, you know, frankly, it's one of those things that if lip service were currency, we'd be billionaires. Uh, it isn't and we're not. Uh, so so it's, it's something where the, the perceived imperatives of K through 12 education, of competing uh, priorities such as health care and corrections uh, all have come to weigh on the general fund. And part of the problem, ladies and gentlemen, and, and if I offend anyone either in this room or in our listening audience, I'm sorry for the offense, but I speak it as I see the truth. What Measure 5 and its aftermath have done to the capacity of our state legislature to respond to urgent priorities of statewide concern is terrible. Uh, it, their discretion is vastly reduced. I remember making a speech on the House floor in 1977, that's 30 years ago, about the magnitude of state school support given by the state. It's 20 times that now. That's mandated by the Measure 5 cuts, which crippled the capacity of local governments to deal with education, forced it to be a statewide priority, and caused, for example, higher education to fall from 12% of the state's budget to 7% in just about four years. So much of that plays into the kind of polarization of party politics that we see, which is there really aren't enough discretionary resources to go around, and there aren't as many as there were when I had the privilege of serving in the Oregon legislature, and that's what makes the public policy times so tough for people, and that's why when in times of plenty, uh, we need to make every effort to make sure that we do stock up on the seed corn and not spend it down. Uh, Larry Wolf, pre uh, uh, the a uh, member of the City Club. Uh, President Frommeyer, you did a very good job, I think, of describing the new tribalism, which is, answers part of my question. The other part of the question would be, why is it, this, this new tribalism is, is, is nationwide. Why is the, the disinvestment uh, so much more intense here in Oregon? And finally, what could the City Club do to help? Okay. Yeah, there, there's a text B of, this, of the talk that I did not give today and that I might have, which is, uh, has it ever been thus? Uh, the University of Oregon was the first public university established in the state, $50,000 appropriation to build what's now Dee Dee Hall in Eugene. And did it start something because the legislative appropriation ran out? It wasn't enough. The building was half finished. And it was the local merchants who really pitched in to finish it. So has this just been always an area of chronic underfunding? Uh, and, and you know maybe there's some truth for that. 
I say to myself, why is it that the political culture of the state of Washington to, to our north, which I always remind our neighbors was part of the original Oregon Territory, uh, wh wh why is the support of the University of Washington system so much uh, more lavish per student and on an overall basis than is ours? Uh, well, for one, it's visible spending. For two, uh, many years before, they had Senator Scoop Jackson and uh, Henry Magison, who just worked t time in and time out to bring federal money to Washington, which then was replicated by the higher education system. And I always wonder how much of it is also the fact that on your way to the University of Washington and the major city of, of Seattle, the drive by Boeing and say Boeing equals engineers equals wealth equals educational necessity equals each other. Therefore, we need to support that because it sustains us. Um, we used to drive by wigwam burners on the way to our major capital center. No, I, I think the cultural difference is very real and that the transformation of our economies, which now have been massive, still haven't been realized. If it were not for the technology boom in the larger Port, uh, Portland metropolitan area in the early 1990s, $13 billion worth of investment, a huge in-migration of highly educated people to help be part of them, uh, we would, in the wake of the spotted owl uh, restrictions, seen a depression in Oregon that would have dwarfed anything that our worst imaginations would have happened. So the, that economic change cushioned, but also disguised, the change from a resources economy to a major knowledge economy. That's happened, but I don't think it's in our consciousness yet, and until it does, we won't have that same kind of political response that our neighbors to the north have had. So that's a, a theory in search of another speech. I ask you to think about it um, because to me that's one way of thinking about how our changing demographics and underlying economic base haven't really quite caught up with the attitudes necessary to support them. Andrew Wheeler, um, I um, understand that uh, Chinese kids um, get up at 7.30 in the morning and go to school and uh, pretty much wrote learning during the day till five o'clock and then they also go to school on Saturday and this has to do with the knowledge economy perhaps uh, and it's a dragon kind of question me being the dragon but um, I, I, I wonder uh, about the idea of uh, educational institutions as being kind of farm teams for uh, the, the whatever is the economy meaning now the knowledge economy I'm thinking about where goes liberal arts and I wonder if you could speak to that, liberal arts and creativity. Yeah, I, I like your question very much and it, because it gives me a chance to say that I, I, I think that over-reliance on science and technology as the exclusive outputs of higher education can be very dangerous thinking as well. Uh, I, I come from, I'm the beneficiary of a wonderful liberal arts education and we try to offer that same kind of education to your sons and daughters and nieces, nephews, and grandchildren at the university. And that's part and parcel of what we do, and I think we do well. And I, I profoundly believe that that kind of liberal arts education really is also necessary in addition to science and technology for the next generations. Uh, there, there's a commonly quoted statistic, uh, I believe it to be true, but it's a prophecy more than anything else, and that is that today's uh, average college graduate will have five or six different jobs, callings, occupations, or professions in a lifetime. And the real problem is that the last four of them haven't been invented yet. So we need to prepare people to learn how to learn through the course of a lifetime without being narrowly and really um, uh, dangerously vocational in that process. That's what a liberal education is supposed to do. That's what it actually has done spectacularly for uh, Americans and Oregonians of this generation. So that needs to be part and parcel of it too. Just another quick aside, uh, th there's always the danger that one can pay a quick visit to a country, although this is now my fifth trip, um, and suddenly decide that cultures can be compared uh, across all kinds of lines and millennia. Uh, of course they can't, but, but one cannot help but be staggered by the work ethic that our neighbors across the Pacific uh, routinely devote to, to their affairs. Just a quick aside, uh, my wife and I wanted to visit a pharmaceutical company that's making a, a compound that could be very promising for the kind of cancers that develop from Fanconi anemia patients. And it, it, the, the license was sold to a Japanese or to a Chinese company. We wondered whether we'd be able to see them. And our uh, our facilitator, who is himself a native Chinese, 
uh, said, uh, what, what time do you have? We said, it's Saturday morning. Do you think anybody will be available? The question back to us was, uh, is that person Chinese or American? Um, if he's Chinese, he will be available on a Saturday. And that did, I think, speak something to us. One anecdote does not a culture make, but it, it told us something about expectations of uh, making things work, and it was really quite sobering. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Dave, thank you very much. I hope our mathematical model doesn't hold, and we'll see you back before January of 2010. <laughs> We're adjourned. <laughs>